Dawn at Dulles Airport, just outside of Washington, D.C. You know, 1494 Dulles Tower, 12606, runway 1 left, third to land, number 2, you're following a gesture in 41 short. 4608, plan on minimum time on the runway, traffic's close and cold. It has been called the most stressful job in the world. One mistake by an air traffic controller. One moment of forgetfulness. One slip of the tongue can mean disaster. Yet most controllers can't imagine doing anything else. Every day at work is never the same day twice. Based on volume, the, the uh, complexity, um, the weather, uh, people are always going to run late and early and everything else. So the, the mix never changes. That's what makes the job so attractive to a lot of us. You're on the edge of your seat, and it's, it's never the same day twice. This is the job. I mean, <laughs> when anyone says, well, what's it like? It's the best job in the whole world. 705129 or 09 There are about 15,000 air traffic controllers in the United States. Every day, they handle over 55,000 commercial flights, guiding them through crisscrossing highways in the sky. It's not just one airplane on that route. They're opposite direction, they're crossing, they're converging, they're diverging, they're doing everything. Imagine a puzzle, and then putting another puzzle on top of that and a third one on top of that, and having to memorize all three of these puzzles, and each different piece of the puzzle is another controller's sector of airspace. So not only are you separating airplanes from airplanes, but you're separating them from other puzzle pieces. Once upon a time, there was plenty of sky in America. The first aviators had the air to themselves. They didn't need much room to take off. And once in the air, they'd follow roads and railroad tracks to get from one place to another. There really was no system out there uh, at all to begin with. You had uh, guys uh, on the grounds literally in the beginning running around with uh, wheelbarrows and flags and uh, setting bonfires. Originally, they didn't even have flight paths. Um, I mean, it was just, there was what they called the big sky theory. You know, so much sky, so few planes, who's going to hit anybody? Today, over 200,000 private and commercial aircraft operate around the globe. Every day, they carry four million people from one airport to another. Dulles controllers can handle about one takeoff or landing every minute. But that's not enough to meet the soaring demand. Basically, it's just constant pressure. As he touches down, there's a company, Boeing 737. It's just uh, right behind him. Once he clears, the next one will be touching down on that runway. Citation 241 off those ground. Turn left on Zulu. Controllers know how much is at stake with every decision they make, but they don't dwell on it. They really don't have time to sit there and think about each individual airplane and how this is going to affect all the lives of those people. You're thinking about aircraft characteristics. You're thinking about call signs. You're thinking about entrail. You're thinking about separation. You're thinking about safety. I think the bottom line is we know what's at stake. I mean, we, we know the ramifications of what we do and what we say. And we know, we know there's people up there. You just don't overanalyze it while you're in the middle right. of it. You you're not thinking, too, yeah. oh, well, this is just a video game. But you're not sitting there thinking, OK, yeah. this is a 747. It holds 240 people. This is a DC-9. It might have 120. You don't overanalyze it. But for the most part, the emotions aren't involved until the moment something goes wrong. And then all of a sudden, when your stomach's in your throat uh, you know, and uh, your shoulders are all tense, that's when you really know it's real. It was about 70 years ago that airplanes first started to carry passengers. By the end of the 1920s, you could take an airplane to most American cities, but only during daylight hours when pilots could see where they were. 
then, radio entered the cockpit. Okay, Bill. Once pilots could talk to people on the ground, it was possible to track an airplane's position as it moved across the country. Are you on time? We are flying exactly on schedule. Radar made it even easier. By the early 1930s, a plane could get you from coast to coast in 36 relaxing hours. There was more and more air traffic, but not much in the way of control. Airplanes flew pretty much where pilots wanted to take them. But in June of 1956, everything changed. Awesome Grand Canyon in Arizona is the scene of the worst commercial air crash in history. Other planes search vainly for survivors after two big airliners collided and plunged to destruction with 128 men, women, and children. The collision over the Grand Canyon shocked the federal government into action. In 1958, Congress created the Federal Aviation Administration, which promptly hired 1,500 new controllers to oversee the new, tougher rules. Now, instead of flying the most direct routes, airplanes had to fly from one radar beacon to the next in a zigzag pattern of jetways that was less efficient but safer. Seven reverse high speed taxiways approved on the 85. Contact ground. Local control is, is the person who keeps the runway hot. US Air 2641, wind 290. Your objective is to get as many aircraft on the runway, either landing and departing, and keeping the runway occupied. When the airplane takes off and he gets a mile and a half or so off the departure end of the runway, you're not going to be able to see him out the windows anymore. That's when they transfer the responsibility to our radar controllers. This is Terminal Radar Control, or TRACON. TRACON controllers handle aircraft on their way to or from airports in the most congested airspace. This can be the most dangerous part of any flight. The few minutes just after takeoff or right before landing when an airplane is under TRACON control. It is here in the heavily trafficked area around an airport that a mid-air collision is most likely to happen. Six years ago, Colleen Spring experienced every controller's nightmare. The loss of separation between aircraft they call a deal. I was working at the TRACON final position, and the weather was instrument flight rules, meaning you could not see outside of the cockpit, uh, so none of the aircraft could see each other. And it was as busy as I have ever seen it in the 15 years I've been a controller. Northwest 624, turn left heading 090. Delta flight heading 190, descend and maintain 2000. Expedite traffic is 3 o'clock and 3 miles turning east. The lower aircraft that I had was, uh, was a DC-9, and the higher aircraft was a jet stream, which, which is a prop. The DC-9 was being vectored away from the final for resequencing because his approach wasn't working. So I climbed the DC-9 to 4,000 feet. The jet stream was already at 4. When I realized that they were going to converge at 4,000, I asked the DC-9 to go back down to 3, and I asked the jet stream to go to 5 and tried to turn them both. Northwest 624, I'm going to take you through the localizer for spacing. Northwest 624, turn right heading 190, descend and maintain 3,000 immediate. Two zero four. That traffic is at the same altitude. To climb immediately to five thousand. The traffic is a DC nine or under you, and it was a climb for you. So then they merged together, and at that moment I held my breath because it's the closest I've ever had two airplanes get together. And uh, you see the targets come together, and you just hold your breath, waiting to see if they're going to come out the other side. Traffic's no factor, fly heading 090, maintain 5,000. And when they came out the other side, big sigh. OK, guys, here we go. We, gotta, we still have a lot to do. There's still 16 airplanes on the frequency that I've got to get on the ground, you know, whilst trying to recover emotionally. There were tears coming down my face, and it, and it was a good 20 minutes before they could get me a break because they didn't have anyone to get me off the position. Approach, contact tower. I took the next week off work 
had a few bad dreams about it and ran a very conservative operation probably for the next year. Um, second guessing myself a lot. Uh, when I had situations where airplanes were cleared to altitudes below other airplanes, I would still look at it over and over again, re reiterate uh, it to the pilots. Uh, you're definitely going to four and you're definitely stopped at five. I would question them, I would question myself. So it took a year before I kind of got over the experience.